That's kind of conversation to your soul. That's conversation to your soul. Hello, Prestige Heads, and welcome to the special holiday Thanksgiving episode of American Prestige. I'm Danny Bessner, here as always with my friend and comrade, Derek Davison, and we are excited to welcome to the podcast Professor David Silverman. Uh, David is a historian at George Washington University and also the author, most recently, of This Land is Their Land, The Wampanoag Indians, Plymouth Colony, and the Troubled History of Thanksgiving. And David, please correct my pronunciation pronunciation if it was wrong. And thank you to the show. You, uh, thanks for having me. And your pronunciation was just fine. Oh, excellent. Well, thank, thank you so much for coming to the show. So that, that is a first in the history of American prestige. <laughs> yeah, we try, but we often fail. That's, a, that's basically our motto. Um, so David, why don't we just get to the, to the impulse behind this book? Why did you feel that you needed to write this book about Thanksgiving? What, what are the major problems with how Americans either understand or celebrate or, or, or whatever with Thanksgiving that impelled you to write this book? Well, there are two reasons I decided to write the book. Uh, one is that I've been conducting research on Native American history for the better part of 20 years. And my first book project uh, many years ago uh, focused on the Wampanoag people of the island Martha's Vineyard. There's a federally recognized um, reservation there of Wampanoag people uh, in the town of Gayhead or Aquina at the far corner of the island. And in the, in the process of doing my research, I reached out to modern-day Wampanoag people um, just to get their sense of the kinds of questions I was exploring. And what came up routinely in the course of our conversations was how difficult Thanksgiving season was for them, and not only for the adults, but especially for the children. And the reason, they said, is that you know their children uh, had to sit there in educational settings and have a, their teachers, authority figures, propagate this myth that their ancestors had effectively conceded to their own colonization, that they had effectively gifted America to white people so that the colonies could blossom into the United States as a bastion of liberty, democracy, uh, Christianity, and opportunity. Moreover, these lessons were almost invariably accompanied, accompanied by the teachers telling the students that the Indians, rarely identified by tribe, were all gone, even as they had Native people sitting there right in front of them. Um, and so, you know, it seemed to me that it was high time for a major corrective. Furthermore, I conduct teacher training institutes every summer at Mount Vernon Estate and Gardens, George Washington's ancestral estate. And my job at these institutes is to help teachers bone up on their content knowledge about indigenous people during the revolutionary era. But during question and answer sessions, what the teachers always wanted to ask me about was Thanksgiving, the history of the first Thanksgiving. And the reason is that that's the only cameo that native people typically make in American history curriculum. And the teachers understood that they lacked the depth of knowledge to address this important subject with the amount of complexity that it deserves. So I wrote this, this book primarily for the Wampanoag people and for teachers who reach millions and millions of American students every single year. That's a great um, introduction. So I feel like there's two ways we could direct this conversation. So whichever path you want to go down is fine with us. Um, we could either talk about the historical Thanksgiving as a holiday, or we could talk about the quote unquote real Thanksgiving. I'd like to cover both, but in whichever order you think makes the most sense. Well, I, let's start first with the myth, right? And I think the myth is is an important touchstone because that's what most of your listeners will be most familiar with. In effect, the Thanksgiving myth is that you know, the pilgrims cross the Atlantic in search of religious liberty. We can we can unpack that claim um, as as well. I mean, these are real religiously intolerant people, um, but nevertheless, you know, they cross the Atlantic in search of liberty, and then lo and behold, friendly Indians greet them at the shore. They have a feast together, and then 
the Indians disappear, right? There's no questioning uh, who these Indians are, why they might be uh, so friendly, or what happened to them after the dessert was served. And, you know, I think any reasonable adult, and, you know, there, there are a fair number of reasonable adults still left in our society. If you, if you ask, you know, do you really think a shared meal is the appropriate symbol for Native American colonial relations? And most of them will say, uh, you know, no. And then I almost invariably follow up uh, with, with the question, so why do we keep teaching this to our children? Why do we keep propagating this nonsense, you know, in our holiday decorations, you know, in our, our uh, uh, auto dealership <laughs> advertisements every every fall, right? It's it's patent nonsense, and yet our society is is awash in it. Um, the one of what I'm trying to do in this book is to hold the myth up to historical truth, and suffice it to say, it just crumbles into pieces. So just speaking ideologically, because this obviously has such contemporary resonance, what function does the myth serve in 2022, 2023, 2024, and beyond uh, America? It, it serves to suppress a critical examination of what American colonial history was all about. And you know, let, me, let me just put it bluntly. Colonial America was a horror show. Um, you, can't, you can't sugarcoat this story. Colonialism as a just a basic uh, as a basic process is a bloody business. It involved in the American context, Europeans conquering the land from native people and engaging in a process of what historians are increasingly characterizing as a genocide. Furthermore, another basic feature of colonialism is slavery. And so, you know, Genocidal warfare and slavery is not the stuff of grade school, especially early grade school uh, history lessons. And yet that's the predominant symbol of colonial America for most Americans by virtue of this Thanksgiving myth. David, I have a quick devil's advocate question just because I this is not what I believe, but I'm curious. Let's admit all of that, you know, from from the beginning. But Americans have so few days where they're able to have off and get together with their families and, you know, meet. So like granted all of that, the historical reality of it, how do you, cause that's basically the, the response I've heard even from people on the left is like, yeah, but what are we going to do about it now? 2020 in the 2020s. I just like to hear your response because I'm, I'm sure you have one to that, you know, sort of obvious critique. Sure. Uh, Let me be clear about what I'm calling for and what I'm not calling for. I am not uh, calling for a cancellation of Thanksgiving. I am not declaring war on Thanksgiving, Um, though I, you know, let let me note um, that quite shortly after this book was published, um, none other than the orange guy in the White House started trumpeting (laughs) that the left was declaring war on Thanksgiving, um, which I think was a direct response to the publication of this book. Uh, That's not what I'm what I'm doing here. What I'm what I'm suggesting is this, Uh, you know, we can maintain the wonderful ritual of getting together with family and friends and offering thanks for what's good in our lives without wedding it to a false and I think damaging myth. And indeed, one of the um, points that this, that my book makes is that white Americans celebrated Thanksgiving throughout the 17th, 18th, and well into the 19th century without attaching it to the the mythic story of pilgrims and Indians. That's actually a a mid to late 19th century invention that really only took hold in the 20th century, basically through a public campaign through the, through the schools. You want to celebrate a traditional Thanksgiving, get rid of the pilgrim and Indian myth. That is the perfect answer. And I'm going to steal that Derek. (laughs) So I, I actually, I'd like you to, to, to build on that, I was going to ask about sort of the history of the myth and when it becomes uh, really salient in in the American consciousness and the role that it plays in sort of excusing or or kind of uh, papering over the genocide of the native peoples. I think the fact that, you know, it's always a story about Indians, you know, kind of without differentiating it, it plays into this notion that this was just one mass of kind of, you know, barbaric peoples that 
uh, had no nations, had no structures, and helps to to sort of soften uh, that history. But I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about when this this really kind of took root the the myth. Sure, um, it's a it's a gradual process that starts building in the 19th century and then really starts taking hold in the late 1800s. So um, the town of Plymouth. You know, which really was a marginal place from its very beginning, started to try to boost tourism in the late uh, 1700s and early 1800s by holding up this obscure group of religious eccentrics, the separatists or or pilgrims, as uh, as America's colonial founding fathers. And you know, this is when Plymouth Rock starts to become a uh, a tourist destination. You know, this. This rock, which actually is, it, there's no documentation that it has any significance in this story. Nevertheless, you know, they, they hold up this, this stone, um, as, uh, you know, some kind of, of mythic place. Um, and so the pilgrims, David, just quickly, what year are we talking? I just want to situate. So myself. this would be, this is af- right after the American revolution that this, okay. this, this process begins. Uh, so Plymouth starts From trying the town to, of Plymouth. The town of Plymouth in Massachusetts. Right. Is, is it whaling? Is is the region doing whaling? I'm just trying to think about. It. So th- they try to basically attach to the to the early mythic associations of the American Revolution, this small town in New England. What they're trying to say is that America's origins date back to the the Mayflower passengers. You know this this, it. the, this this obscure group of separatists. Hey, let's be clear, Plymouth Colony was a nothing place. It was lightly populated. It's economically unimportant. um, And it's eventually annexed by Massachusetts and kind of fades into the mainstream of Massachusetts history. So Plymouth's trying to carve out a tourist niche for itself. So they're trying to lionize the, the pilgrims as colonial founding fathers. In turn, there was new public interest in the primary sources of Plymouth history. And there's two main ones. One is called Mort's Relation. The other is William Bradford's of Plymouth Plantation, which is still fairly widely known. So in 1841, um, a minister in, in New England publishes Mort's Relation. And Mort's Relation contains a one paragraph account of a feast in 1621 held by Plymouth Colony to celebrate its first successful harvest, at which 90 Wampanoag warriors make an unexpected appearance. And to that one paragraph, he added a footnote. And the footnote read, this was the first Thanksgiving, the Harvest Festival of New England. Now, trust me, as a historian, there aren't a lot of famous footnotes out there. But this was one of them. And enough people read this account and the footnote that the idea introduced by it that this was the first Thanksgiving began to take hold. And then lecturers like, you know, Thoreau and Emerson and John Quincy Adams start spreading the idea in their oratory and writings until it becomes widely propagated. Then Abraham Lincoln takes the holiday, which had been effectively a regional holiday for Yankees um, in 1863, and declares it as a national holiday. Okay, so by this time, the myth of the first Thanksgiving had become attached to the holiday, and now it becomes a national event. Now, as to your question, you know, why does it take hold nationally? That has a lot to do with the culture wars of the late 19th century. And there are a number of different factors at play. One is that white Americans, especially Protestant Americans then, as now, were deeply anxious about immigration. But the immigration was coming from Europe. It's Catholics from Ireland and Germany and eventually from southern uh, Southern Europe. And eventually you have Jews and Eastern Orthodox uh, immigrants from from Eastern Europe. Well, by holding up the the Protestant pilgrims as America's founding fathers, it becomes a way for them to assert their cultural authority in American society. The, the Indian Wars for the, for, of the Great Plains in the Far West were also winding down. And so at that moment, the United States could incorporate this population that it had for centuries denounced as bloodthirsty savages and then give them an unthreatening role in a national founding myth. Not least of all, this allowed New England, whose prominence in the country was slipping as the nation was expanding westward, to 
reclaim uh, authority in the national narrative by holding up these these uh, these pilgrims as seekers of religious liberty and friendly Indian relations. It allowed New Englanders to distance themselves from the so-called black problem of the South and the Indian problem of the West, and effectively create a sanitized national founding. So, in other words, you have a number of different cultural issues at play in in this myth. One thing that uh, let's just keep on talking about the Thanksgiving myth, and then we'll return to what actually happened, just for for listeners. So, how does this become a associated with sort of like this cosmopolitan melting pot Americana, or, or does it become associated with that? Because in, in my mind, you know, this maybe this is not even right. Like the the, the family and the Godfather would eat Thanksgiving together, you know. Um, and so, how does that happen over the course of the twentieth century? It's in the public schools more than more than anything. Um, many schools throughout the United States, beginning in the early 20th century, um, lasting even up to today, even though the um, the trend is waning, uh, would hold Thanksgiving pageants in kindergarten or first or second grade. And in these Thanksgiving pageants, teachers would have kids dress up like pilgrims and Indians to reenact the myth. And by the way, I was in one of these Thanksgiving pageants and I was cast as a tree, uh, which tells you something about my acting skills as a, at a young age. But you know, what they're trying to do in these contexts is to get a diverse group of school children to identify with the pilgrims as we, or in other words, as fellow white people. And very often these pageants would include singing My Country Tis of Thee, right, which holds up the pilgrims as my fathers doesn't hold up native people as my fathers, right? Native people are outside the boundaries of the national fabric in this, in this ritual. They exist only to hand off their country to the pilgrims and their descendants and other white people who will follow. Even schools that didn't hold these pageants would have students create, you know, cardboard cutouts of pilgr- happy pilgrims and Indians holding hands and would sing patriotic songs. So, you know, it took it, it, these rituals would take children like you and children like me and get us to identify with those pilgrims as fellow white Americans. Did anyone deal with the irony that a holiday b- basically formed in white Protestant reaction because of a, a mechanism of white making over the course of the 20th century for ethnic immigrants, uh, quote unquote, <laughs> ethnic immigrants? Or is that like because there's an irony there um, in, in some way? Uh, the multi- multitude of ironies that are baked into this ritual have been entirely lost on the American public uh, throughout most of the 20th and 21st centuries, suffice it to say. David, do you think there's anything else to add on the myth of Thanksgiving or should we return to the the real history? Um, You know, what I'll I'll just add uh, to this discussion is this. Wampanoag people and other Native people have stressed to me repeatedly how difficult this season is for them. Uh, Not only in the schools, but just driving around and seeing households and businesses uh, decorated with these Um, images of happy pilgrims and Indians, which makes light of their very real historical traumas. So before we get into talking about the real historical Thanksgiving event, um, I'm, I'm curious what you think is sort of the myth's greatest sin against history is. Uh, My, from my perspective, it's this something you've talked about already a couple of times uh, in this interview. It's the emergence of the Indians kind of ex nihilo. They appear and then they're gone. There's no sense that these people were already here for thousands of years. There's no sense that they uh, continued on and continued to struggle afterward. It's this, this erasure, basically, uh, of any sort of context. But I'm, I'm curious what your uh, kind of, what, what the, the, the thing that really sticks in your craw, I guess, about the myth is. Oh, where to begin? Um, you know, I've written <laughs> upwards of 400 pages uh, about what sticks in my craw. I think, you know, I think the main one uh, is this. Having a shared meal symbolize Indian colonial relations is rather missing the point, not only in general, but in in particular. 
there, there's no question about it. There was indeed an alliance and a shared meal between the pilgrims and the Wampanoag Indians of what's now southeastern Massachusetts. But after the dishes are, are cleared, this relationship goes to hell in a handbasket. And within the second generation, the two people are engaged in what you can only characterize as a genocidal war, a war in which the pilgrims' descendants nearly wipe out the Wampanoags and their native allies who are in resistance against colonialism. That's the essence of their relationship. Though the Wampanoags benefited in the very short term from their alliance with Plymouth, it only took a matter of years before they began to resent this decision. So maybe we could just building off of that, I think it'd be interesting for our listeners to, you know, go back to the real history and, and get a sense of what, what was Wampanoag society like in, in 1600 and, and what is the real history of the transition that happens over the course of the of the 17th century in, uh, in native and pilgrim relations. And we could also, you've gestured toward it throughout the conversation, but like, who were the pilgrims? What was their actual ideology? What did they want to do with the world and all that um actual th- stuff that happened in real uh, history. All right. Well, you know, let's, let's start with the Wampanoags and, and clear away some ideological underbrush. We are trained to think of the Americas on the eve of, of colonization as a new world and as a wilderness. And you know, it was nothing of the sort. Uh, human beings had been in the Americas. The date keeps getting pushed uh, back farther. Uh, with every new archaeological discovery, um, we now actually just in the last couple of months, there's an archaeological discovery that dates uh, uh, human activity in the Americas 22,000 years. Okay, so I don't know how new that is. Uh, that seems pretty ancient to me. And, you know, the Americas are full of people. They're full of civilizations. And they have a very long history before Europeans show up on on the scene. Yeah, the the way that we're taught would have us believe that native people in the Americas were frozen in time until Europeans arrived. Simply not true. I mean, they they had evolved, they had changed just like everyone else around the globe. So, you know, let's start with thinking of the Americas as an old world full of civilizations. You know, not a wilderness, a place full of civilizations. By the time the Mayflower arrives, you know, southern New England alone has upwards of 100,000 people living in it. You know, it's going to take until the 18th century for colonial society to reach those those numbers. What's more, what is the form of political organization? Because oftentimes, sure. tr- quote unquote, tribes, right? But that's not, not right. anywhere near the truth. That's not very helpful um, to under. So anthropologists call the organization of groups in this region of what's now the United States paramount sachem ships. So here's what it means. Um, most people live in small communities about the size of a village. Uh, let's say several hundred people. Those several hundred people would be allied with other neighboring villages under the leadership of what they called a sachem. And they would pay tribute to the sachem um, in the form of corn, labor, um, furs, and just political deference. In turn, those sachems would pay tribute to a great regional leader called a paramount sachem. And that paramount sachem... To some degree, it's a protection racket. I mean, yeah, the, the paramount sachem will threaten war on those groups if they don't pay him tribute and deference. But if they do, we'll protect them from from outside enemies. And they would and, you know, they framed this relationship in kinship terms. They'd say, well, now we're brothers with one another and we love each other. <laughs> but same language, same language or mutually intelligible different languages. Uh, they would speak. They would speak the same language. So these are all Algonquian language speakers with minor dialectical differences. Um, so you know, it, virtually all native people from Maine all the way down to uh, Virginia spoke Algonquian uh, languages. Um, and the farther you went, the less intelligible they were. But they're all part of the same basic language family. Uh, think of it as like the Romance languages. I guess would be uh, be one way to put it. So, you know, that's the, the organization of the people that greet the pilgrims um, in, in 1620. 
Now, these folks had been in contact with Europeans for a minimum of 100 years before the pilgrims arrive on the scene. I think which is a shocker <laughs> to, uh, to most people who imagine that the arrival of the Mayflower is first contact episode. It's not. And these contacts between the Wampanoags and Europeans had become annual affairs from 1602 onward. And what often happens is, you know, these explorers, they come from several different European nations, show up on the coast, the two groups trade with one another, and almost invariably it turns violent. Sometimes it turns violent when the Europeans sense a threat or when native people steal something from the Europeans. But many other times, the Europeans kidnap native people from the coast and bring them back to Europe. Sometimes they sell them into slavery. At other times, they're trying to train them as interpreters and guides for future voyages. And as a result of these processes, two Wampanoags had been to London spent years in the city and made it back to America before the arrival of the Mayflower, which is why you have this figure Squanto on the ground who can speak English and interpret and mediate between the two groups uh, after the Mayflower arrives. Just one question, David, actually. Um, what is the economy? What is the political economy of this of this region? I'm very interested. Is it, Are people trading from Maine to Virginia? Um, how is that organized? There are cross-continental trade networks. So you will find goods at various native sites throughout the Americas that come from hundreds and often thousands of miles away. Now, this is not to say that individuals are traveling thousands of miles, but you have down the line intertribal, if you will, uh, trade networks that are disseminating goods and ideas and sometimes people, captives, <laughs> uh, uh, th uh, through this trade. So these are not isolated people in any way, shape, or form. Right? You know, they're not engaged in um, overseas trade so much, but they're not isolated whatsoever. Before we return to the main story, this is a bit of a wonky question, but I'm a Europeanist and I've read so much about the transition from feudalism to capitalism. Is there a way for people who might have been um, focusing more uh, on, on Euro um, history? What, how would you describe this form of political, economic and political organization that's happening in, in the 15th, 16th and 17th centuries amongst the Wampanoag? It's a tribute paying society. And so you have leaders who are constantly uh, vying to defend and expand their following of tribute payers against other leaders who are trying to do the exact same thing. Um, and it's a fairly cutthroat business. Um, I wouldn't liken it to feudalism. Uh, it's not nascent capitalism. It is a thing unto itself. Um, but the scale of these societies is much, much smaller than what you find in Europe. You know, Europe organizes populations numbering in the hundreds of thousands and even millions of people. Let me be clear about what we're talking about here. The paramount sachems, uh, sachemships or tribes of southern New England, or for that matter, the Chesapeake region of Maryland, Virginia, max out at about 30,000 people. And usually they're about half that number. So in terms of the competition between societies, it's apples and oranges. Native people are just not organized on the scale of Europe. And that's going to have severe consequences as we get deep into the colonial era. Thank you. And, and sorry, let's return to the main story about, you know, the quote unquote real Thanksgiving. Sure. Well, so... the the This century of contact between native people in Southern New England and Europe has two primary consequences for the, the Thanksgiving story. One is this native people of Southern New England knew who these people were. They knew they were ruthless. They knew they were treacherous, but they also knew that they had incredible material goods, um, metal I mean, native people are stone age people. They don't have metal. And all of a sudden these people from across the ocean show up. They have hatchets, knives, scissors, needles, swords, kettles. Finally, you can cook directly over the fire. That's something they've never been able to do before. We're talking, we're talking about a potential consumer revolution that's deeply attractive to them, which is why, even though they were repulsed 
by the violence and treachery of these people, they were also attracted to them at the same time. The second major consequence is the introduction of epidemic diseases from across the ocean. Smallpox, the plague, pneumonia, flu. These diseases have devastating effects on native people in, in the Americas. It's you know, one of the most significant disasters in modern world history. In, the, in this particular case, the Wampanoags and their near neighbors contract an epidemic disease. We don't know the identity of it, but they, they contract an epidemic disease that ravages their population between 1616 and 1619, reduces their numbers by at least three quarters. And the reason that matters is this. The Wampanoags rivals to the West, the Narragansett people, didn't contract the disease. Now, look, if it's a communicable disease, that tells you something about relations between the people. All right. Well, the Narragansetts are taking advantage of the Wampanoag's weakness on the eve of the Mayflower's arrival to try to subjugate the Wampanoag's to tribute paying status. And does that occur through military conquest? What is the function of that? Like, how, what, how does that actually occur? What does subjugation look like? Right. It's military conquest. Uh, you will either pay tribute and political deference or we'll kill all your men and take your women and children. And, and that's that's how it works. So when the when the pilgrims arrive, the Wampanoag leader Usamequin or Massasoit has a choice to make. Should he welcome these people into his country? Uh, you know, when Europeans have this long record of battling with coastal peoples and kidnapping them and enslaving them, or should he try to harness them, harness them to his own ends in order to fend off the Narragansetts, and funnel their trade through him so he can reconsolidate the Wampanoag polity. That's the choice he makes. And in the short term, it works. The Wampanoags defend their autonomy. Osamequin's authority is ascendant. But in the long term, it's a total disaster. Let's talk about the quote-unquote pilgrims. Who were they actually? What was their ideology? In particular, what is their view of what I imagine they thought of as the quote unquote new world and their relationship with native peoples and, um, you know, all those questions? Well, they're Puritans of a sort, um, like the pure, they're, they're close religious kin of the Puritans who populate Massachusetts and Connecticut and the rest of, of New England. But they differ with the Puritans, um, a Protestant. Uh, 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 group uh, on one major point. The Puritans are a reform movement within the Anglican Church, the Church of England, and they contend that the Anglican Church has too many holdovers from the Catholic Church, which they consider to be the bastion of the devil. You know, what they say is, look, uh, you know, unless uh, the Anglican uh, Church finishes its separation from the Catholic Church in every single respect, its followers are as likely as not to be going straight to hell. Um, they call themselves Puritans, and their detractors call them Puritans, because they're trying to purify the Anglican Church. The pilgrims call themselves separatists, and their contention is the Anglican Church is so beyond reform that it ha there's no hope. So they say, let's break with it entirely. On matters of Where theology are they from in England? Sorry, where are they from in England? Is there a base of their uh, organization? Are they organized around charismatic leaders? I just want to get a sense of who they were in the UK, the former uh, sure. UK. <laughs> um, they, they hail predominantly, certainly not exclusively, from Essex County, um, just a short, short distance outside of London, um, and from England's Midlands. They they tend to follow the orbit of you know particularly charismatic preachers um, to be sure usually Cambridge or Oxford ed ed educated men you know these are very learned uh, people they know their Bible backwards and 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 forwards um, but the separatists are a very minor group within the larger Puritan movement now they were so intolerable to Anglican authorities that they have they. They sought refuge in the Netherlands, which is a place where uh, Protestant dissidents from all over Europe flock during the 17th century. Um, first, they settle in Amsterdam, and eventually they move to the city of Leiden. But they found 
life there so difficult. And it seemed that the Netherlands was going to get wrapped up in another war with Spain um, so soon that they decided they had to go somewhere else if they were going to live their religious lives as they wished to do. And so they start looking to America. Now, I would note, originally, their their destina- intended destination is the Hudson River, where, of course, the Dutch will eventually form a colony. And that's, in fact, where the Mayflower was heading. But they find it difficult to round Cape Cod, and they're running out of fresh water, and they know that they're going to be risking their lives if they continue the journey. So they, they decide to settle in southern New England, outside any chartered bounds. They have no permission from any authority to settle in this place. So they're separatist in more ways than one. Is there any sense of, I mean, obviously the the main motivation here is to get away from the authorities to establish their own religious community. Is there any sense of a, a, a conversion mission or a civilizing mission, quote unquote, uh, on the part of the pilgrims, or is it purely about kind of preserving their own uh, community, and that's that's you know why they come to the Americas. There isn't a single colonial initiative in the Americas, English, French, Spanish, Portuguese, what have you, that doesn't proclaim its intention. Indeed, that doesn't proclaim that its main intent is to Christianize and civilize the savage pagans. Um, some of these colonial ventures make good on uh, on that proclamation. Um, and in the case of the separatists of Plymouth Colony and the Puritans of Massachusetts, they do indeed, um, within a matter of several years, begin evangelizing Native people. And it, New England is the only place in the English colonies where that happens in earnest. It's one of the distinguishing uh, patterns of, of New England colonization. And indeed, upwards of half the Wampanoags by 1675, are Christians. And not only Christians, but now literate Christians. The first Bible printed in America is in the Wampanoag language. The Wampanoag language, that, that's one of the first publications of Harvard University Press. Um, the Wampanoags were not a literate people. They did not have alphabetic literacy before the beginning of this evangelical campaign. But English missionaries, and then eventually native missionaries to Native people begin teaching alphabetic literacy uh, to to uh, neophyte Wampanoag Christians to the point that you know upwards of a third of Wampanoag men are literate by the late 17th century. It's an amazing feature of 17th century colonial New England history. So why don't we return to the story? So the separatists land in southern New England, and then what happens then? Well, um, Usa Mequin leads the Wampanoags in forging an alliance with with these people. And I must emphasize, um, over the descent of a significant number of his people who wanted to wipe this place out, uh, some of them, uh, the English catch wind, are negotiating with the Narragansetts to attack Plymouth and just wipe it off the face of, of the map. You know, what you, these folks say is, you give these people a beachhead and they're going to make our lives very, very difficult. Turns out they were right. But Usamequin has other fish to fry. And so he forms an alliance uh, with these folks. They form their settlement. Uh, He protects them from their native enemies, provides them with fresh food while they're trying to get their their agriculture off the ground. And the place survives. Now, let me emphasize, Plymouth never becomes a significant colony. It's always underpopulated. Um, It's always dwarfed by its neighbors. But by becoming the first English colony in in New England, it provides a basis for the foundation of Massachusetts to the north, which is a much more significant place. Between the the late 1620s and 1640, upwards of 15,000 English men, women, and children flow into Massachusetts Bay. And then they start reproducing like rabbits. By that, I mean this. The women who come over in that migration are on average giving birth to eight children over the course of their uh, childbearing lives. It's, it's a recipe for a population explosion. Well, meanwhile, 
Native people are being eviscerated by the epidemic diseases these people are bringing. And so eventually the English start throwing their weight around, expanding at the expense of Native people, trying to assert their jurisdiction over Native people, encroaching on their land, evangelizing them, encouraging Native people to stop paying tribute to their paramount sachems and instead to throw their loyalty to the English. And so the tensions build and build and build until after the death of Usamequin in 1660, his sons, Wamsutta and then Pometacom, otherwise known as King Philip, begin saying, our father made a dire mistake. What we need to do is actually all Native people need to band together and force these people back into the ocean. And of course, Jill Lepore wrote her first book on quote unquote King Philip's War. And I, I think that most people might not even know what that is. So, so uh, do you mind just going into it? And, and we could maybe as far as is, is possible the next 15, 20 minutes or, or less, um, take us up to roughly the revolution, focusing on New England, which people, uh, the history of which people might not be aware of. Sure. Um, so as I mentioned Usamequin son, Massasoit sons, um, led by King Philip or, or Pometacom, conclude that if Native people don't band together in resistance, everything is going to be lost. And by everything, this is what they mean. They say, look, these folks are going to take all our land. They're going to reduce us to debt peonage. They're going to force us into servitude. We'll have no autonomy over our own lives. And they are certainly correct in all that. So what it produces is a nascent pan-Indian movement in which Native people who had never thought of themselves as a single group of people appropriate the English term Indian and begin using it to rally a multi-tribal resistance to colonial expansion. Now, the English catch wind of these plots, and it leads to near wars almost every other year for about 15 years until finally the, the dam breaks. Why the dam breaks is this. Now, the English had been provoking the Wampanoags in every which way up, up to this point in time, but they finally push it too far when they arrest, try, and execute three high-ranking Wampanoags for the killing of another Wampanoag in Wampanoag territory. If they can do that, right, if they can seize, try, and execute Wampanoags according to English-only systems, then Wampanoag lives mean nothing. And so they, the two sides go to war. Now, on the eve of this war, uh, Philip, or Pometacom, meets with an English Just what year is this, just for people to... Know. Sure. It, uh, the war breaks in, uh, in June of 1675. On the eve of this war, um, Pometacom actually meets with an English magistrate and just unleashes a litany of grievances to them. But what stands out in that exchange is this. He says, look, my father protected you people. You people wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for us. We could have wiped you off the map and we didn't. And now you have the balance of power. And what do you do with it? You exploit us in every way you can conceive. There's no living with you anymore. And so he leads his people to war. Now, this war is small at its beginning, but eventually it spirals outward, largely because the English don't trust any native people when they proclaim their neutrality in all this. The English start trying to confiscate their weapons. They start seizing their leaders and saying, we're going to hold you as hostages for your good behavior. They start demanding Native people to turn over Wampanoag non-combatants who have taken refuge with them. And they keep forcing one Native group after another, after another into this war. Now, at the beginning of the war, the Native resistance fighters are getting the best of it. They, uh, they repeatedly uh, destroy colonial towns. They ambush troops on the march. But eventually, their luck runs out. For one, the English are successful despite alienating so many Native people at recruiting other Native people to their side. And here, I think, is an important point for your listeners. There is no such thing in colonial America as a purely Indian colonial war. Every Indian colonial war involves some Native people siding with the colonists against other Native people. Because 
their main concern is the intertribal balance of power and self-preservation. So the English managed to recruit the Mohegans, the Pequots, the Mohawks of the Iroquois League, and Christian Wampanoags over to their side. And it proves to be a difference maker. Furthermore, the native resistance fighters are trying to live on the march without you know, without their cornfields or fishing stations accessible to them. They start starving. Disease starts cutting through their ranks. And so a year into this war, they many native people start accepting a late English offer of quarter of mercy in exchange for switching sides. And so by the summer of 1676, the gig is up. And indeed, in what we can all only call Pometacom's nightmare, he's shot down by a Christian Wampanoag uh, in, in Wampanoag territory. And when the English uh, recover his body, they sever his head and send it to Plymouth and pike it outside the town on the very site where Pometacom's father had feasted with the pilgrims. And later that week, Plymouth declares a day of thanksgiving in praise of God for saving uh, New England from its native enemies. This war shatters native power in southern New England. It doesn't wipe out the native population, though that population is severely diminished, but it shatters it. Native survivors from the resistance flee to the upper Hudson River Valley in Canada. Others, the English enslave, upwards of 2,000 of them putting some of them to work in New England, sending others to the West Indies, Gibraltar, and even Tangier. As for those native people who had sided with the English, well, now they're faced with the very fate that Pometacom was resisting. The English take almost all their land, leaving only a few reservations for mostly Christian Indians. They reduce them to debt peonage and then force them into what we can only call judicial slavery. By my estimates, half of Wampanoag adults and children were, were, were forced into indentured servitude, effectively slavery to English households between the late 1600s and uh, focus on the state, the early 1800s. So we're talking about 150 years of relentless, relentless exploitation. What that means is the Wampanoags aren't even raising their own children anymore. And it means they not only lose their land, they not only lose their religious traditions, they lose their language and become English-only speakers. It is, it is only an act of sheer uh, resiliency that has allowed Native people to survive in southern New England up to this day, and only barely. And then, of course, their, their genocide becomes incorporated as the Ur-American holiday, to, to add uh, insults. To injury, so that's I, precisely right. Yeah, and I think that very little, um, <laughs> very little encapsulates the ironies of American history more so than Thanksgiving. Um, so, David, you've been with us for a while, but I wanted to give you an opportunity if you had anything more to say or, or any major, you know, <laughs> not even lessons, but points that you'd like to leave our listeners with as they head into their own Thanksgivings um, this week. Well, uh, I have a dark message and maybe a more, a more uplifting one. The, look, the dark message is, is this. You know, we're uh, engaged in this debate over American history education, which arises every gener generation or two, but basically pivots on this. Some Americans think the purpose of a history education is to breed patriots. And indeed, I, yeah, I, I that's been the norm in human society since the beginning of, of human society. But as a history educator, my belief is that the purpose of a history education is to help us understand the complexity of history in all of its complexity. And I don't care whether you come out of that process feeling patriotic or unpatriotic, only that you're seeing the truth as clearly as we can grasp it. And we have to decide what it is we want out of a history education. Do you want your patriotism to be based on the truth or do you want it to be based on myth? There's plenty in American history to be proud of. There's also plenty to be ashamed of. And we should look at both of those things with very clear eyes, in, in my opinion, if we want to improve 
our society to have it reach its fullest potential. Now, as for Thanksgiving, um, what I would say is this. We don't have to attach the ritual of offering thanks for what's good in our lives and getting together with family and friends to this false and I think damaging myth. However, if we're going to insist on attaching this story uh, to the holiday, we got to get it straight. Um, Because if we don't get it straight, A, we're doing real damage to our Native American countrymen and women. And they are now, as a result of colonization, our countrymen and women. And we owe them that at the very, very least to look at their difficult, traumatic history, the apocalypse, really, um, in their lives uh, with, with clear eyes. But it also damages the rest of us, too, because it means we don't understand where our own country came from. We don't understand the very culture that we're suspended in. Um, And I don't think that's good for anyone. David J. Silverman, thank you so much. Everyone check out his book, This Land is Their Land, The Wampanoag Indians, Plymouth Colony, and the Troubled History of Thanksgiving. Thank you again so much for joining us. I appreciate your attention. Thanks. Thanks.